uh, ITM uh, Antwerp and the people online. So welcome to the academic uh, uh, seminar, Tackling Emerging uh, Infectious Diseases by Professor Katharina Kreppel. I'm Anne Verlinde from the research uh, office. I'm happy to replace my colleague Casper uh, today, who recently became father of a baby girl, Roxanne, just for you to know. <laughs> Katie, you joined uh, ITM, I think almost uh, two years ago or two years ago in 2021 to lead uh, the unit of uh, emerging infectious diseases in the public health uh, department. You're an epidemiologist specialized in emerging infectious disease and the One Health uh, approach with extensive experience uh, in uh, disease vector ecology and zoonotic disease epidemiology. You did your work, your PhD work at the University of uh, Liverpool and the Institut Pasteur de Madagascar, and there you looked at the effects of uh, uh, climate on the epidemiology of uh, plague. After your PhD, uh, you studied the behavioral ecology of uh, malaria vectors. Uh, you were seconded by the University of Glasgow to the Ifakara Health Institute in uh, Tanzania. And in Tanzania, then, as already said, you specialized in the One Health approach, approach, and today you're still a professor at the Nelson Mandela African Institution of Science and Technology. Katie, you will present now, I think, during 30 minutes, so that we have uh, plenty of room uh, for discussion and uh, exchange. So, Katie, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, yes, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce the small but very special Emerging Infectious Disease Unit from the Department of Public Health. Um, and then also a little bit about my work and how I came to the One Health approach and how to use it in my research. So here you can see our unit. Uh, we are part of the Tropical Infectious Diseases Group in the Department of Public Health. Uh, in that group, we have the Socio-Ecological Health Group and the Mycobacterial Diseases and Neglected Tropical Diseases Group. And like I said, we are a small unit. We are almost four. So that means we have a senior researcher, Beale van der Berge, junior researcher, Luciana Lepore, um, me, myself, and then also a postdoc who hopefully will be joining us sometime in July. So we are almost four people. Now here is a bit of an idea of what we are working on. So these are the pathogens we are working on. And even though it looks like a lot of very different things, you can see our cornerstones. Um, and these cornerstones are rodent bone diseases such as mpox and plague, for example and the arboviruses such as dengue, chikungunya, zika, rift valley fever, of course, as well. Now, I would like to, sorry, I would like to introduce our group members, and I'll start with Dr. Verle van der Berge. Um, her research focus is mainly on heterogeneity of disease transmission for several pathogens, but also on drivers of transmission, and the evaluation of impact of interventions and control strategies. And here you can see her main um, areas of co collaboration. She does a lot of work in Cuba uh, together with the IPK and Mar um, Maria Eugenia. I never can say it, Eugenia. <laughs> she is here today and it's her birthday today. So happy birthday. <laughs> And you can see here in the picture um, also a workshop that was given uh, where Viele uh, took part and a little bit of the research there. Uh, you can see the dengue hotspots that uh, were present in Cuba at the time of the last outbreak. And of course, uh, Viele van der Berg is also well known in DRC and does a lot of research there together with the INRB, with the Creed project, for example. and. You can see here the big picture with all the, all the people at the bottom. That's uh, from the Crete project. And um, the picture in the corner on the right, you can see the University of Kikwit in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And there she has been holding and leading the data for action course that has been adapted to the Congolese needs over there. And if you have a look, we are a very small unit. However, we do have 
very far-reaching collaborations. And here you can see the collaborative links of Verle. In green, that is for her research. In blue, all the development cooperation and service deliveries. And in red, you can see the education parts. The outer circle is for the world, and then it becomes more focused until you end up with the Department of Public Health. So that gives you an idea how many links Vela has in her research with different departments, different units, different research institutions, and all across the globe, basically. Then we have Luciana Lepore, and Luciana is mainly active researching Rift Valley fever, uh, but also other arboviruses in DRC. And in DRC, she has the um, possibility to do research in Goma, what is a little bit of a problem at the moment. Uh, but she's part of the Creed project that also has research going on in Kenya and Uganda. And I can show you here the big consortium that is behind that project. And also a few pictures here from the INRB in Kinshasa, um, a little bit up there in the corner where she is um, discussing with technicians in Goma. And also right here at the bottom, that is in Kenya, where they also have a research part for that Creek project. And finally, there's me. Um, my research usually has focused my whole career, scientific career, on climate effects on vector-borne diseases, but also transmission risks of zoonotic diseases, and also um, has developed into an area that looks at challenges to receiving and providing treatment for certain diseases. And here you can see the countries and the types of animals that I'm working with. For example, in DRC and Cote d'Ivoire, I'm looking at monkeypox, mpox in rodents. In Madagascar, I've studied also rodents, but also fleas, the vector for plague. And in South Africa, there are plans to also start a collaboration to look into rodent-borne diseases. So everything that rats can basically give you. However, I do have a past um, with five years of research in malaria ecology. And you can see that beautiful colorful mosquito that is biting there. That's an Anopheles arabiensis. It's a malaria vector, but it is an interesting malaria vector because it can choose if it wants to bite animals or if it wants to bite humans, depending on, I guess, what it feels like on that day. And that is something that we also wanted to find out if it really can choose or if there is a reason why it would bite cattle on one day and humans on the other day. But my research also has spread out together with the One Health approach um, into projects that are looking at brucellosis. That is um, here an example is a Tanzanian um, Maasai herding boy drinking from a cow directly, um, as well as other research projects that are looking into rabies and rabies elimination. Um, and then a little bit of a side project also on snake bite. But on snake bite, it was one of my foci challenges to receiving and providing treatment. So I was not looking into what pathogens a snake can give you. And here for me, um, when it comes to research, then at the moment, I'm collaborating within ITM with all the departments. Also, there's a collaboration ongoing with the University of Antwerp. Then there is through Verle a collaboration with the University of Ghent. Um, I still have my old connections from my PhD times with the University of Liverpool and new connections with the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Um, new connection is INRB in Congo. This is what I was introduced to as soon as I started here, of course. Um, and then there is IHI, the Fakara Health Institute, where I spent five years in Tanzania, seconded to, so they are also still quite close. Then there's the CSIS, that is a research institution in Cote d'Ivoire, and they are the ones that 
got me into One Health because this is where I was employed and started working on the One Health approach. And of course, there's NMIST. This is the difficult one that Anne mentioned so successfully. That is the Nelson Mandela African Institutions for Science and Technology in Arusha. And when it comes to education, you can see I'm involved in a few courses at ITM, but I'm also giving lectures for the Hamburg um, University of Applied Wissenschaften, so the HAW, uh, part of the TROP ed for this year, the first time. Uh, again, NMIST, and then also I'm working together with the Zanzibar based School of International Training. So that's it from me. Now, when we go back to the name of our unit, the Emerging Infectious Disease Unit, then the first thing that people are asking is, what do you mean emerging? What is emerging? And then I usually come up with this list. This is a very incomplete list. Um, and you can say there's a lot at the moment emerging and re-emerging. Uh, the list is much, much longer, but this gives you just an idea of the things that were lately in the media and that people have heard of, such as COVID, of course, then arboviruses such as Zika, Dengue, uh, then diseases like Ebola, then we had MERS, we had SARS, we had swine flu, and of course, what we still have is the avian influenza. And Mpox is also something that has been in Europe and has been in the media recently. Now, when we talk about researching and um, controlling emerging infectious diseases, it is important to remember how infectious disease, how this triangle works. So we have three parts in our infectious disease. We have our host, so usually the animal or human that gets sick. We also have the vector, if it is a vector-borne infectious disease. Then we have, of course, the pathogen that we definitely need and we have the environment. And one big player has, is for the environment is climate. And of course, in the last few years, in the last few decades, climate has become more and more important because it started changing so much. And for emerging infectious disease research, we have to take into account all these different parts. You cannot research the infectiousness or the transmission if you do not take into account all these three parts. And the aim is always to understand what's going on, hopefully to predict what will happen, and then to work on some sort of adaptation, some sort of control, some sort of strategy, some sort of intervention. And when you talk about emergence and re-emergent, the main factors involved, like I said, for example, one would be climate and climate change. But we also have issues with biodiversity, as most of you probably know. Uh, biodiversity is going down. The dilution effect is going down. Basically, that means that there is more chance for pathogens to uh, infect more um, animals, to infect humans more often. Uh, simply because there's not such a healthy family of different species living in um, suitable habitats together anymore. If you want to know more about the dilution effect, then you can see me afterwards, because it takes quite a long time to explain. But the decreasing biodiversity is definitely one. Oh, sorry, is definitely one of the factors that is increasing the emergence and also the re-emergence of diseases. When I talk about re-emergence, then a re-emergence is not simply yet another outbreak of something, but re-emergence is also the slow increase of some diseases that we thought we are already on the way of eliminating. Malaria is one of these things, for example. Before the coronavirus pandemic happened, we were actually still on the down trajectory for malaria. Uh, I remember the, the annual malaria report that reported 400, 430,000 deaths only. Now we are well past that again. It has gone up and I think it's at 600,000 or something like this again. So this is re-emerging and it went slowly. It's not that there was a sudden malaria outbreak. 
it just went up slowly. And very often these are the most dangerous diseases because you don't notice. Um, yeah, so for example, this is um, another factor. You have your intensive farming. We all know what intensive farming does. Certainly avian influenza, uh, swine flu, for example, even MERS that is usually transmitted by camels. Camels are also intensively farmed, by the way. Um, these are all effects and factors that are affecting the emergence of diseases. And of course, we have transport and urbanization. Together with transport and globalization, pathogens can basically travel wherever they want. Vectors can also arrive in very, very uh, remote, exotic places. And that's why 60% of all known infectious diseases and 75% of emerging infectious diseases are actually zoonotic or vector-borne. That's a huge amount. Basically, that means when you look at vector-borne and zoonotic diseases, and as I said here, it is actually quite a complex system, that you end up with a complex problem to understand, to understand how this transmission works, to understand ways to control this is quite difficult. It's not simply one human has an infection, gives it to the next. We are talking about a whole system with the environment and the climate. Everything has to be just right for the infection, for a spillover to humans to occur, for infection and outbreak to happen. And we need to understand how this works. And we have complex problems, and this calls for complex approaches. And this is where the One Health approach comes in. And for everybody now that thinks One Health is something to achieve, it's not. One Health is a research method. People have been using the term a lot, and a lot of people have not properly understood exactly what it means. So One Health, when we talk about One Health, we are not talking about everybody being happy and healthy. We are talking about an approach, a method to do research or a method to do control, a method to do an, an intervention or a method to bring public health to more people. So the WHO says One Health is an approach to design and implement programs, policies, legislations and research in which multiple sectors come, why is that happening? In which multiple sectors communicate and work together. That also means that One Health is not simply veterinarians talking to doctors. That is not a One Health approach. That is part of a One Health approach and very important, but it is not everything. One Health to use a One Health approach means looking much further and looking into the system much more. And we have the so-called quadripartite um, that was signed last year. Um, and what I mean with signed was that these four big organizations basically have uh, come to an understanding to push the One Health approach, try to work together to fight emerging infectious diseases and outbreaks. So here you can see you have the food and agricultural organizations. These are dealing a lot with intensive farming. They're dealing with the poultry factories and the pig factories and the big intensive farming to produce everything that you see in your supermarkets every day. Then we have, of course, the UN Environment Programme that also includes conservation efforts. That includes the drive to increase biodiversity or at least stop the decrease of biodiversity. You have the World Health Organization that represents everything that is human health related. And you have the World Organization for Animal Health. So these four are now tackling the problem of emerging infectious diseases from their sides. So each one from their angle and from their side. And when we talk about the One Health approach, um, then to see if research is really using a One Health approach, you can look for these indicators. This is something that can help you to see, is this really a One Health approach or are they just using it as a buzzword? 
or is there in my research project is there room for another view another um, collaborator that could actually provide some help and these indicators are first of all collaboration if you like it or not if you want a one health approach you have to start talking to people collaboration is the number one indicator then we have added value when you just do your little research project or when there is just one control strategy that you're evaluating then you might miss out on an extra added value by bringing in somebody from another discipline to help you or to support you or do research alongside you that comes up with certain findings or certain impact that you alone would have not been able to um, generate. Then of course we have system thinking. You can't just think in your little box. You have to think of the bigger system. Transdisciplinarity. Transdisciplinarity there is a lot of confusion sometimes between words like multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity. And there's an explanation for all of them, but just as an indicator, transdisciplinarity means that the findings of another discipline are essential and improve the findings of your discipline. Multidisciplinarity means that people from different disciplines are working together. That doesn't matter, that doesn't mean they have to rely on each other's findings. That doesn't mean their research methods are incorporated or you depend on them. You just do your research and they do their research. And yes, you get a multidisciplinary outcome, what is certainly more valuable than when you just do your research in a silo, but actually you don't depend on it. It also means you don't have to fully understand it because the findings are not relevant for your project outcome. It's the safe option. It's a safe option when you do a research project that both do their parts in parallel. You both have your, your milestones to reach and your things, but you don't depend on each other. So if the social scientist fails, then the quantitative scientist, the epidemiologist, doesn't yeah there's no problem for their research project or the other way around trans proper transdisciplinarity means that you really have the same aim you work towards the same goal and you have to collaborate properly together so that is another indicator for a proper one health project then another thing that i'm very passionate about is participation of stakeholders i've seen throughout my career that it doesn't matter what amazing ideas you have or what amazing findings you come up with, if at the end, all that happens is that you give a good conference talk and have a high impact publication, the community hasn't really gained anything. If you do not speak to the community from the start, if you do not understand and listen to the community that you are actually trying to help, then your research project doesn't get that added value. You might have done really, really good work, but it's not going anywhere. It will not change anything, except for the next topic of the next scientist that uses your methods. What is great, but if you don't have your stakeholders, the communities you're working with, the policy makers that should take on your new intervention, or the people, the simple people and the doctors that are working with your diagnostic test, if they are not part of it, then your influence and your impact will be quite low. Then, of course, we have gender and equity in it. If you cut out half of the population, no matter if it's the men or the women, you do not end up with a useful finding. And I'm saying that because in a lot of interventions that are um, geared towards for example, maternal health, um, people learned the hard way that it actually gives added value if you include the father. So these are just some, some experiences that came along with One Health. Implementation, of course, is usually also a goal of a One Health approach. Most scientific projects, unfortunately, cannot cover everything. They cannot cover interviewing the community to figure out what they need all the way to 
coming up with a new control method that then eradicates the emerging infectious disease. And the last thing is sustainability. If you come up with an idea, with a new surveillance tool, with a new platform, with um, some sort of new research method or control, then the big question is, is it really sustainable? Will it go on? So this is me talking about the One Health indicators, but now I would like to introduce a little bit to you where I come from, how my, how my career, how, what brought me here to ITM. And the first thing I did was uh, doing a PhD in a very strange country. As you can see here on the right, um, the island of Madagascar does have some very unique, strange creatures that you only find there. The bottom thing that looks a bit like a very sad dog cat thing is a so-called fusa. It's a predator. Then above it is its favorite prey. That is a ring-tailed lemur, a lemur cutter. That's a very little one. They've, they can be very nasty. Um, and right on top is something that most people do not find that interesting. This is a very specific flea, a rat flea, that you only find in Madagascar. And when I did my PhD, I was sent to the Institut Pasteur de Madagascar, to the plague unit, and I was supposed to have a look how climate, not your daily weather, your climate, like the El Nino and the Indian Ocean Dipole and all these really big things, the cyclones, the, the droughts, the heat waves, how they affect the epidemiology of plague. And the first thing that I did was simply have a look at the plague cases. These are human plague cases. So what is happening in Madagascar? The plague that we all think died out a long time ago is still very much alive. And in Madagascar, it is very alive and has a season. It comes up every year with several human cases. In some years, we have bad outbreaks that go up to 200 cases and also deaths. Um, and in some years, we have much lower numbers. But basically what is happening is people are getting bitten by a flea from a rat that has suffered from plague or is still suffering from plague, or they somehow get in, get in touch with the rat itself. For example, when you see a dead rat in your garden, what do you do? You pick it up. And this is exactly the point where you get in contact with the rat. And if your rat died of plague, what has not happened in Belgium, but if your rat died of plague, then you might end up with a flea that happily jumped up on you from the dead rat, and you might become a victim of plague. Now, this is how um, basically plague gets transmitted. It can then develop into pneumonic plague in the person that got infected. And then the person can give it to another human just by coughing at them. That is then another way of transmission and much more dangerous. Now, I had a look at the climate and I figured out quite quickly that depending on your temperature, your plague cases go up or down. That was quite easy to see. So basically plague is seasonal, but the question was why? Rats are around all year. Fleas are happy on the rats all year. So why would there be this dip in what is in Europe, the summer months? So out we went um, with a really strong team from the University of Liverpool and the Institut Pasteur, and we started to collect everything. We collected the rats, we collected the fleas, we brushed the rats to get the fleas, we hoovered the rat burrows to get the fleas out of the rat burrows, we collected the soil, we collected the data on the weather. I was putting data loggers into the rat burrows to measure temperature and humidity in there. We literally sampled anything we could think of, quite desperately really, because we had no idea why climate would affect this plague transmission, these human plague cases. And after doing a lot of sampling, um, we found that throughout the year, there's a difference in the flea species we find on the rats. And there's also a difference on the numbers of fleas. And then we wanted to know if the demographics of the fleas also changes. And then they decided that the PhD student from Germany 
should go into the lab and start dissecting fleas. So there I stood. And this is a picture of the ovaries of a female flea. Um, so I spent quite some afternoons dissecting fleas. I never thought that I would do that in my whole life. Um, but when you look at the ovaries, you can find out how old the flea is. And that gives you an idea at what point the fleas stop producing, reproducing so much. Because the idea was, well, there is this dip in the human plague cases. So maybe it's linked to the fleas. Maybe it gets too cold for the fleas to develop or something like that. And that's basically exactly what we found. We measured the temperature and humidity, as I said, in rat burrows. And here you can see at the bottom, the blue um, graphic, graphic there, that we found um, that inside a building, the temperature stays more even, while outside it varies a lot. And then we went one step further. We had a look at the big climate. And we wanted to know if the big climate phenomena like Enso and Indian Ocean Dipole affect plague cases. And guess what? We found that there is an effect. But of course, in life, if nothing is ever easy, it is not a linear effect. So it's not like if we have an El Nino, then we get more plague. Or if we have a cyclone, then we get less plague. No, it can't be that easy. It really depends on the downward um, passing of all the information of the climate, what happens to the fleas, what happens to the rats. And also, as I found out, as you can see here, human behavior. Humans obviously also have a schedule across the seasons and they behave differently. And for example, when the harvest is being brought in, in Madagascar, people store it in the houses. Now we have Unfortunately, the food from the field for the rats is gone. It moved into the houses, so the rats move into the houses. So there are all sorts of these different effects. However, I was not a human behaviorist. I had no idea about climate sciences before I did this. So this was my first taste of multidisciplinary, trying to put these different disciplines together and come up with an overall picture. And what we found, just on a on a flea on the flea level, I'm not going to go through all the other things. We have these two flea species. The top one, the brown one, is the flea species that you find all over the world on rats. It is very happy to give you plague, and it also can be found all over Madagascar. But you can see here with the coloring of the islands that we have the yellow and the red parts only in the central parts of the island. This is the highlands of Madagascar. And this happens to be also the place where you find this strange flea that is only present in Madagascar. So therefore, I did a little bit more work on the fleas, on their development, and I figured out that this particular combination of having these two flea species and their different reaction to climate is what keeps the plague cycle going in Madagascar. After doing all of this climate thing and getting to know multidisciplinarity a little bit more, I then moved on to malaria vectors in Tanzania. Uh, there, there was a big NIH project together with the University of Glasgow uh, and the UC Davis, University of California, on the possibility that malaria vectors in Tanzania are starting to change their behavior. Um, and that they are starting to avoid bed nets. Now, the whole point of a bed net is not only that it stops the mosquito getting to you, yeah. um, but also that when it goes on the sprayed bed net, that it then takes in the pesticide from the bed net and dies. And the same is true for sitting on the walls. However, if the mosquitoes are changing their behavior, do not go anywhere near the net anymore, or do not rest on the walls inside anymore, then these control options do not work. So we wanted to find out if that is the case. And we went to the Kilomero Valley uh, with IHI, and we found that the behavior of the mosquitoes has indeed changed. 
that because of the bed nets that were handed out everywhere and that were covering the control methods that were covering all the households, it seemed like the mosquitoes changed their behavior in terms of where they like to rest and where they like to try and find people to bite. But what we also found was that our technicians who came from the villages of the target population, the technicians that are doing the human landing catches here on the left, that they got quite annoyed. There is a lot of research going on, a lot of malaria research, and we need a lot of human landing catches, as we call them, so humans that are sitting all night with their trousers up to the knees and are just waiting for the mosquitoes to come and bite them. And when they sit down on your leg, you suck them up with that little aspirator thing. But the problem is every time a mosquito starts biting them, they could get malaria. And also, it's not really nice to be bitten. And the other problem is also when you have your research projects, you might have a technician who is just really, really tired because the kid had a cough last night. And then these Technicians have to sit there at night and fall asleep. Therefore, it is really unreliable to say, well, I collected this many mosquitoes. So the village elders, actually, that you can see here at the bottom, they came up with an idea and said, come on, we've been doing this for years for you. We've been working with you to combat malaria that is plaguing us, that is killing our children. But we are still sitting there for years and years now with our trousers um, folded up all night. So they said, why can't you come up with an idea? You know, these mosquito zappers or fly zappers that you hang up in restaurants that just zap your insect. And they said, why can't we build something like this for the mosquitoes? And that's what we did. And I can quickly show the video maybe, if that's possible. Do I just click on it? Yeah, good. And basically together with the biotechnology unit at the University of Glasgow, something was developed, but I can't play it. Okay, doesn't matter. We get out of it. This is a very short clip. If I go out of there, will everything close down? Or is it a sharing business? Yes, very quickly. So this was the community idea and then developed with the University of Glasgow and the Ifokara Health Institute. And this is a mosquito electrocuting trap that is not there to kill the mosquitoes. It is there to collect the mosquitoes. So that means that a person is sitting in there perfectly safe from mosquitoes because they are flying into the grid, they die, but the grid is not charged enough to totally burn them. So you can still do, for example, genetic analysis, what is really important when you do mosquito research. Okay, now when I go out, I don't want to. And that was my first flavor of including the community into research. And here, this is just an example of um, a project, again, on climate and malaria vectors and how big climate can affect um, what is happening on the ground. But after getting a little bit of a taste of this One Health approach and working together with the community, I then changed um, my institute and went to the Nelson Mandela University in Arusha. And I joined as a postdoc training coordinator, the Africa One Aspire program. And the Africa One Aspire program was a multi-country, multi-African country program that was supporting PhD, masters and postdocs in doing One Health research. And it had Anglophone and Francophone countries in there. And um, the initiator and the leader for it was Basiru Bonfo. You can see him there in the middle. And 
he is based at CSRS, the Centre Suisse de la Recherche Scientifique. And these are the people that I started working with for the next four years. And very quickly, going over some of the One Health approach that I was doing. Uh, for example, here you see Caroline Mburu, now Dr. Caroline Mburu. And she was working on brucellosis. Brucellosis is also an emerging infectious disease. It's a zoonotic disease. It comes from cows. It is bad for cows, but it's also bad for humans. And the traditional research approach was usually have a look at the prevalence, get vaccination sorted for the cows, and make people aware that there is a risk, that there is a threat, and tell them, go vaccinate your cows. But it didn't work. It doesn't matter how many projects were looking at the prevalence, how many projects were coming up with vaccination strategies, and how many NGOs were giving awareness campaigns, brucellosis did not go down on the contrary, it actually went up. Therefore, we wanted to do a One Health approach. We wanted to look at this problem from different angles. And Caroline Buru went out and she basically went into the communities trying to figure out what is going on. And what she found was the people knew about brucellosis. They knew the disease. They knew the symptoms in themselves and in their cows. But it wasn't a priority. There were so many other problems. It's a bit like us not taking migraines seriously because we get used to them. And there are many other problems that we have. And for them, that was really one of the main reasons that they did not get motivated to do anything about it. There were a lot of other things that were far more important to them, other diseases to look out for. That brucellosis was really nothing to worry about. They didn't see that there is a threat from wildlife. Wildlife can give brucellosis to cows and the other way around. And when we talk to the politicians to say, look, you have it, you have brucellosis on your priority disease list. Why is nothing been done? Look, we, we talk to the communities and it's not going anywhere. Then they were simply saying, well, you see, there are lots of other problems and the people that suffer are not the people that vote for me. It's as simple as that. At least that was an honest politician. And using a One Health approach like this, um, I also started some work on dengue in Tanzania. Uh, the angle was a little bit different. We have a dengue problem in Tanzania. You can see here at the map in red, all the areas that are at high risk of having dengue outbreaks. But the people, the doctors, cannot diagnose dengue, dengue that well. So I uh, have a student that went out to see what the diagnostic capacity for dengue is in a country that is experiencing repeated dengue outbreaks. This map was published in 2016. It's a predictive map to tell Tanzania and the scientific community where the possible threats are, where the possible hotspots are for serious dengue outbreaks in humans. Guess what happened 2017? We had a dengue outbreak because nobody looked at a predictive map. And that gives you an idea also what is happening if your science doesn't get taken further. You cannot do anything about it if nobody is listening, but at least there should be some effort in trying to implement possible control methods, strategies. And one of these methods was getting doctors aware of the possibility that there might be a dengue outbreak. And that means that health professionals should be able to diagnose dengue. And also health professionals should have dengue tests available. But none of that was present. And together with the Bernard Nocht Institute for Tropical Medicine, and the ISIDA project, we then came up with a diagnostic app for health professionals to help them remember the symptoms for dengue and diagnose dengue. But of course, first we needed to see how to make this app. What do the doctors actually want? You know, doctors in Africa and many places now have a lot of apps on their smartphones. 
so many apps produced by so many research groups. But hardly anybody really asked them what they want from an app. And then the doctors stand there and they constantly have to say, they have to add so much information. What they actually just want is the symptoms. Just what, what could this be? A quick list of symptoms and what to do next. But to figure that out, you do need a social scientist and you do need to ask the doctors. Right now, I'm doing some research on MPOX. I wrap it up, I promise. I'm, I'm doing some research on MPOX. I've been there just three weeks ago. Um, we want to have a look at transmission risks from rodents in DRC and in Cote d'Ivoire. So this is a project that works in two countries because in DRC, people are trapping or children are trapping. You can see in the middle there, that is a rodent trap and eating rodents. And in Cote d'Ivoire, they also eat rodents, but they farm them and they only farm the big ones. And then they bring them to the restaurants where the people pay a lot of money to eat them. And we really wanted to know which way is actually healthier, which way is better in terms of transmission risk, just as a starting point. And we haven't been to Cote d'Ivoire yet to figure that out, but we have been to DRC collecting the rodents doing a lot of questionnaires, ODK, to just listen to the people to find out how they um, collect the rodents, how they prepare them, how um, dear it is to them, so how much they like them. We ask, for example, if I give you a handful of chicken meat and a handful of rodent meat, what would you eat? The rodent meat, much tastier. So things like this, I think, at least, are important before you come up with some idea how to control a disease. And this is just a, a very good example, I can talk about that later, of a really good One Health approach that really has all the indicators I spoke about in it, including sustainability and implementation. And that is the team that worked on it. And here you can see all the different disciplines that were involved in this. And it's a transdisciplinary approach, which means they all depend on each other. So these are the current projects I was talking about. And for the unit now, we also have, of course, future projects. What we are uh, going to work on will be further focus on rodent-borne diseases, uh, also on arboviruses, including also education on global challenges, treating malaria during floods, so having a little bit of climate still in there, and febrile disease characterization and surveillance in East and Central Africa. These are all our future um, endeavors. Thank you. So thank you, Katarina, for this uh, very interesting uh, talk. So we have... Uh, uh, still yeah, like uh, 10 minutes time for discussion and questions and I would like to take off with uh, the first uh, question if there is a burning question in the room then okay then I can uh, kick off I like your slide on, on the one health approach uh, very much one health as a method and uh, on your slide it was about communicate work together the systems uh, thinking transdisciplinarity but I wondered, how do you make this work in practice? Eh? How do you make the people, eh? because you can indeed, is it the magic just bringing the right people uh, together or eh, because you refer to a training, is it about training uh, the people in a, in a One Health approach? So how do you make this work in practice and what do you see as uh, challenges there? Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, there are a lot of challenges simply because if you try to work with other disciplines, you are meeting very different personalities with very different aims and very different priorities. What I found works best is, yes, doing some training in One Health, simply getting everybody on the same page so everybody knows what would be the best outcome. But also what is important is you can keep your own priorities. There are ways to make sure you keep your priorities and you make sure that your research does not fail if somebody else doesn't pitch in. So there are possibilities to do that. But yeah, these are my, this is my advice. I've seen it work in many, many instances and I've seen it fail sometimes as well because it is difficult to work with the other disciplines. Mm -hmm. 
So, and, and based on the project that you mentioned, is it then that the people who you bring in in the project from the dif different disciplines that you train them then upfront, or, or how how do you see this? I think you you learn together. So mm -hmm. if I contact the social scientist from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, I tell them very, very clearly what my aims are. But I also say, look, I know there is a social science aspect in there and I do need your help. And I think this, I do need your help is something that a lot of scientists do not do. They think, oh, well, I'm a quantitative scientist, but surely questionnaires are not that difficult. And oh, wow, focus group discussion is simply a few people in a room. Or other way around, taking measurements for social scientists that then say, oh, we're just going to measure a little bit the temperature here. Um, I think the first thing is that you really, that you are clear about the fact that you're not an expert in everything and that you do need the other disciplines. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions in the room? Yes, Bauke. Lovely talk uh, and very, uh, it, it looks like you've, you've had a lot of fun in all your research as well. I was wondering um, if you look at the zoonotic potential, like how many animals get infected versus how many humans, brucella is right up there. Eh? It is highly infectious. And, and yet you find that the community says we don't care. So how do you... Um, if, if you also think of uh, Brucella being coming from cattle, from husbandry, you can imagine that 80% of the mammals on this planet are uh, animals we keep for our food. You'd think that it would be a high priority, but if the community says, no, uh, <laughs> yeah, please I leave us alone, how do you handle those types of priority? The, the, the best example I can give is what happened with COVID. People just get used to it. Um, and with Brucella, that was it. The herding boys are drinking from the cows while they're herding the cattle in, in a very you know, hot climate. They don't have a Coke bottle with them or water. They just go to the cow and take a drink. And there is no reason not to do that. And there's no alternative. So I think it's a lot about alternatives and yeah, giving people a choice. And having a choice, unfortunately, is very much linked to awareness, education, and resources. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think the reason why they don't take it seriously is because they are just so used to it. Thank you. Other questions? Yep, there is a question from the audience online. Uh, the question is uh, about involving the community, the local communities. For example, in the DRC, it's a zoonotic hotspot uh, where the wildlife is usually part of the local people's diet. So in most of these people, uh, in most of these places, the people consume wildlife on a daily basis. Uh, we know that this has consequences like risk of zoonotic spillover, loss of biodiversity, etc. However, just saying stop consuming our wildlife is not a feasible or appropriate message. Do you have an idea on what would be more appropriate or what could actually be the message? Well, I can tell you I'm working on that message because that was that's what my project is about, going there, listening, trying to find out what is important to the people, um, trying to find out what they actually do. I'm, I already saw that there are a lot of things that could be implemented to reduce the transmission risk, not to cut it out. Like you said, you can't just say stop eating them, but you can reduce transmission with some wash training or with some awareness raising, things like this, just um, yeah, to reduce transmission a little bit. However, I can tell you more, maybe breeding these rats in big farms might be an option for DRC as well. However, we don't know, maybe having intensive farming of rats is a problem in itself. So this is what we're trying to find out. I'll let you know when I'm done, whoever asked that online. It is really tricky. And I think the first step is always to actually really figure out what the community wants. Yes, another question online? Yes, please go ahead. 
Yes, in the meantime, we received another question. Um, it's somebody who's very curious if you have found the role of poverty in the transmission and re-emergence of these illnesses. Uh, I think so, yes. Um, I think a lot of control and adaptation has something to do adapting to climate change and the effects of climate change on diseases, for example, has something to do with options. You can adopt, adapt when you have alternatives and when you have options, and you do have more options if you're richer. So yes, poverty has something to do with it. Um, if you do not have much choice, if you do not have many alternatives, then very often you're at high risk of yeah, getting a pathogen that might be not transmitted to somebody who can choose another route. Thank you. Any other questions, Bauke again, or is there still somebody else? No, then it's Bauke again. Yeah, also the exciting work on plague to figure out why specialized endemic uh, flea was uh, implicated in Madagascar. And I think Yersinia pestis blocks the gut so that the flea stays hungry, the blood doesn't get to the stomach and it keeps biting, biting, biting. Is that different in different flea species? Yes, it is different in different flea species. That blood clot does not happen in all flea species at the same rate. But in our case, in my case, the climate was affecting the microclimate in the burrows where the fleas develop and the different flea species um, preferred different temperatures and humidities. And that simple difference meant that you have different numbers of fleas at different times of the year. And that had an effect on the giving the pathogen um, to one another and to keep the pathogen alive through the season that usually has not many fleas, doesn't see many fleas of this one species, but the pathogen gets carried over by the other species that are, is a bit hardier, that's a little bit more adapted, um, does not block as easily as the other one and therefore also doesn't die as quickly. Thank you. Other questions? No, online? No? Saskia, you want to? No? Yeah, I, I think it's about time for a drink. Don't you think, uh, Katarina? Uh, uh, it was very hot in the room. So you're all invited uh, here. I'm sorry for the people online, uh, but we go for a drink now. Uh, you're all invited in uh, Karibu, just uh, across uh, the street, to have a drink uh, uh, together and discuss uh, further with uh, uh, Katie. Thank you very much. <laughs>